Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Bryony. I'm an SD4 in uh, North East London, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, migrant and undocumented children with a particular focus on access to NHS care and associated safeguarding issues. Um, I'm aware that my internet connection is a little bit dodgy, so please do let me know in the chat if you're struggling to hear me properly or if there's any issues with the slide sharing. Um, and yeah, and please do put check questions in the chat as we go along. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is just kind of give you an example case study and then talk about some of the different healthcare needs of migrant children. There's, there's hundreds of whole separate talks um, around these topics. So I'm going to be particularly focusing on the issue of charging in the NHS and um, making sure that everyone's aware of what rights children have and then talking through some work that um, I did um, along with some others with the RCPCH looking at the impact of NHS charging and then using that as a way to kind of draw out some of the safeguarding issues. And I'm going to finish with a number of suggestions about what we can do as paediatricians um, when we meet children who are facing charging and also when we meet children who might be survivors of trafficking or experiencing some other associated issues to do with their migration status. Um, so just to start with a case study, um, this is a um, made up case but based very much on some real cases that um, we've been told about through the RCPCH. Um, so Aisha is a three month old baby girl um, born in the UK. Uh, she presented to her local DGH with severe breathing difficulty um, um, and even during the clerking, there were some concerns that the family had presented quite late. Um, she'd been quite unwell before arriving. They didn't have a GP. Um, and on taking a social history, you realise that they're living in a single room in a house of multiple occupancy with other families in the household. Um, she was found to be in heart failure and found to have a large BSD. And she's doing very well um, on diuretics, but obviously she's going to need some definitive surgery scheduled at a future date. So while you're liaising with the tertiary cardiology centre planning that care, they tell you that due to Aisha's family's immigration status, before they can schedule the surgery, um, she will need to pay the full cost of the corrective surgery upfront to that tertiary centre. So what I'm hoping um, you'll be able to get out of today's talk is an understanding of what Aisha's rights are to um, NHS care, understanding why her family might be being billed, um, thinking a little bit about some of the wider social issues that might be going on for her family, um, and then as her doctors, what can we do for her? So just as a kind of just start off, um, I think it's worth saying that um, migrant children are a huge and heterogeneous group. So um, we're going to be focusing today on some of the most vulnerable um, of migrant children. But actually, there are many, many, many children who have migrated or are children of migrant parents in this country. Um, many of you listening today might fall into those categories or have children who would count as migrants. Um, so the, the particularly vulnerable category is quite a small proportion of migrant children. Um, on average overall, um, migrants tend to be healthier than the local host population. And that is generally because um, most migrants are young adults who have lower health needs than the, um, the general population in the host country they arrive in. So that might not be so applicable in paediatrics, but I think it's really worth pointing out because a lot of the kind of popular narratives in the media around um, migration and health would kind of have you believe that that um, this is a group of people who have huge, um, you know, burden on public services and things. And actually, on average, that's not true at all. Um, but today we will be focusing on some children who probably do have some particular health needs, um, perhaps more than um, than um, the local host population. So um, talking through um, 
some particular groups that you might be thinking about. So um, unaccompanied asylum seeking children, so um, children and young people who have um, come to the UK alone or without their parents, um, children who lack formal um, immigration status, um, I'm going to talk a lot more about that, and that includes lots of children who actually um, uh, have lived in the UK their entire lives were born here. Um, some children who have specific additional needs either to do with their physical or mental health might be those who have travelled um, to the UK during their life and have faced additional risks either in their country of origin um, or on their journey to the UK. So they may have um, been um, subject to trauma due to war or discrimination in their country of origin. Um, they may then have made journeys which are quite um, precarious. So they may have been exposed to um, additional diseases en route, to risks due to a lack of access to healthcare en route and things like that. I'm not going to really talk that much about those things today, but I think it's just worth bearing in mind when you do meet um, children, whether you need to be considering those issues. And I think particularly the mental health concerns might be something that we um, under-recognise. Um, a proportion um, of uh, undocumented and migrant children will be subject to severe poverty and destitution. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Obviously, um, that's something that we probably should be considering in all children that we meet, not just those um, of a migrant background. Um, children who have been trafficked themselves or who are um, born to parents who've been trafficked and um, have got some specific additional needs and um, particularly um, relevant to the safeguarding topic. And then obviously um, children who have other additional vulnerabilities and needs such as a disability or chronic medical condition will of course be additionally vulnerable on top of whatever other needs they have. Um, and then I think it's just worth mentioning, and again, this is a whole talk in itself, um, many talks in itself, but um, there's obviously a huge amount of racism and discrimination towards immigrants in this country. And even um, those children who may not be have any of these other risk factors are likely to face um, a degree of racism and discrimination at some point. And we need to bear in mind that that also um, has health risks in itself. So I'm not um, an expert at all in um, you ask so unaccompanied asylum seeking children so I'm only going to touch on them very briefly um, but I just wanted to basically signpost to um, this really good uh, guidance that the RCPCH has. So as paediatricians and um, particularly junior trainees we're probably most likely to meet you asks during community paediatrics doing um, medicals and lack medicals for these children. Um, so there's a really great guide um, guide on the RCPCH website talking through the different things you need to consider, including some uh, physical health needs and mental health needs, use of translators and safeguarding risks. So I'd really encourage you to have a look at that. Um, you may also come across um, these young people from time to time um, in A&E, and um, they will usually already have a social worker and, and be a looked after child, so good liaison um, will be important. Obviously, if you meet um, a young person who is an unaccompanied migrant, is under 18, um, or you think they might be under 18, um, and they're not already known to social care, then um, they need a referral because that will give them access to um, to housing, to healthcare, um, and to ongoing support. Um, great. So um, another sort of specific, very vulnerable group um, within uh, these children is is those who've been victims of trafficking. Again, this isn't an area I'm going to talk about in huge depth. Um, I just want to thank Sarah Boutros for her help with the slides on trafficking. Um, there are a lot of um, likely victims of trafficking within the UK, and almost half of those are children. Um, and we may also come across um, situations, particularly um, in maternity, as so neonates, but um, also in general paediatrics, where um, the parents have been, themselves been victims of trafficking. Um, there's growing recognition of this issue and a growing number of referrals to the uh, trafficking 
national referral mechanism. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about trafficking, the way that overlaps with NHS charging, and then I've got some tips at the end very briefly about things you can do if you're worried that somebody might be a victim of trafficking. So I'm going to come back to this. Um, so then just to focus more on another particularly vulnerable group um, is that of undocumented children. So when we talk about undocumented children, what we mean is children who lack regular migration status or paperwork. Um, so that applies to an estimated 120,000 children in the UK, and over half of those will have been born in the UK. So there are a lot of ways in which children can end up being undocumented. Um, children's immigration status usually relies upon their parents. So, um, Usually this will be because the parents themselves are undocumented. That might be because they came here on a visa um, and then outstayed their visa either because um, they couldn't afford to formalise their um, status and um, because their home country became unsafe um, or for other reasons why they've, they've continued to stay in the country. Um, it might also be things like the Windrush um, uh, we're still seeing some um, younger people who've been victims of, of the Windrush scandal. Um, so um, families who've just never formalised their, their immigration status in this country, having come here on originally legal routes. Um, it may be that the family had an asylum claim, but that's been rejected and they are um, nevertheless um, unable to, uh, for multiple reasons travel back to their country of origin so they're kind of stuck in this situation where they, they can't have their asylum claim recognised but they can't um, go anywhere else. Um, they may be um, a victim of trafficking and that's so far gone unrecognised so they're, so they're lacking um, paperwork in that respect um, and I think it's just worth um, emphasising that the cost of regularising your immigration status in this country is enormous. So um, many people who would um, have be able to get um, a visa in terms of kind of their background, their risk factors, their asylum claim are unable to do so just because of the costs. So um, a huge number of families end up um, sort of stuck without that status for that reason. Um, so, the reason I want to focus on undocumented children um, is because those children um, are particularly vulnerable in a healthcare setting um, because of the NHS charging regulations, which leave them ineligible for care. Um, so, there's been NHS charging for a very long time, actually, for those who um, don't have formal UK um, immigration status, but um, it's been massively ramped up. Um, within the past uh, six or seven years. Um, so that kind of goes alongside with a um, whole suite of regulations that are kind of described as the hostile environment. Um, so under these regulations, as they've been ramped up, we see people who um, are not eligible for care being charged 150% of the NHS tariff for secondary care. Since 2017, hospitals have been obliged to charge people up front for their NHS care, so before they receive it. Um, and I'm going to talk through the, the rules around that and the exemptions in a minute. Um, and there have been increasing links between um, the NHS and the Home Office. So um, if you have a debt to the NHS, um, the NHS can, can share that information with the Home Office and that may block you from ever being able to regularise your immigration status. Um, obviously, um, or perhaps not obviously, but it's worth mentioning that uh, since we've exited the EU, um, thousands and thousands of more people, um, including children, have um, immediately lost their entitlement to NHS care. So, um, as paediatricians, I think um, it's important for us to be aware a little bit about what um, children do and don't have access to um, in terms of free health care and the reason it's important for us to know is because this is really um, poorly understood so we may often come across families who are being wrongly charged for care um, and so we can act 
act as their advocates to try and help them access healthcare. And also, even those children who um, are unfortunately subject to charging under the regulations um, do still have the entitlement to certain types of care, and we need to be aware of what that is so we can help them access it. So, NHS care um, uh, that can be accessed by anybody, regardless of, in, um, of immigration status, is primary care, so GP services. Um, and A&E. So this is about being in the A&E department and not about the urgency of care. So however much of an emergency it is, if you're not in the A&E department, um, it doesn't fall under this, this exemption. Um, so it, lots and lots of people face barriers to registering with the GP, but actually everybody has the right to do so. And I'll come back a little bit to that um, later in terms of what you can do if your patient's facing barriers to registration. Um, but yeah, everybody has access to a GP, everyone has access to A&E. Um, family planning services are exempt from charging, although abortion services are not, so you can still be charged for an abortion. Health visiting and school nursing services, um, following some campaigning, they remain exempt from charging. And if you are treated under the Mental Health Act, i.e. Um, against your will, um, then you cannot be charged for it. Psychiatric care that is voluntary is chargeable. Um, so that's the, the services. So basically what that means is anything not in that list, i.e. secondary care, so outpatient clinics, and including um, a lot of community paediatrics, outpatient clinics and then inpatient services um, are all subject to charging. Um, so then we need to think about who is charged and who is not. So again, this is very complex. Um, lots of patients should not be subject to charging because of their um, immigration status. So if they are formally recognised as being asylum seekers, they have refugee status or they're formally recognised as a victim of trafficking, then they shouldn't be charged for NHS care. And all children who are under the care of a local authority, so unaccompanied asylum seeking children, should not be charged for NHS care. Um, but um, people who fall outside of this, which might be short-term visitors, um, such as tourists, or more importantly, because it's much more of an issue, um, children who are undocumented, they will be charged for care. And then finally, there's some certain um, conditions that are exempt from charging. So basically notifiable infectious diseases, including COVID, um, and, and then additionally HIV and TB care are all exempt from charging. And the difficulty arises if you don't know that diagnosis yet, um, and that is a huge great area. Um, and then in the in England specifically, um, and I should actually say while I said that I'm talking about um, specifically about English regulations, Scottish, Northern Irish, and Welsh regulations are similar but not as restrictive. Um, so the the other thing that's exempt is if you are being treated for a condition arising from specific forms of violence, then that treatment is free. Um, obviously, it might be quite difficult to get to the point of a good trust relationship where you realise that somebody's um, health condition has arisen from torture um, if they've originally presented with abdominal pain and there's a huge issue there with getting to that point of a trust relationship if you're charging somebody up front. Um, I think this is um, perhaps the slide on charging that I most want you to remember because I think it's the largest area of misunderstanding. So um, there are some specific rules around if a child's treatment or, or an adult's treatment is urgent or immediately necessary. I think a lot of people think that if treatment is urgent it becomes free and that is absolutely not the case. All secondary care is chargeable, regardless of how much an emergency is. Um, the reason why this is important um, is because it allows you to treat the patient first and bill them later. Um, so immediately necessary treatment is kind of obvious, it's, it's really immediately life-saving treatment. 
treatment that is deemed urgent is anything um, that cannot wait until the um, the family or child leave the UK. So if they're here for two weeks on a, on a tourist visa, that might be quite straightforward, whether or not it can wait two weeks for them to go home. But if they've lived in the UK all their lives, we're not actually expecting them ever to leave the UK. So treatment that you might deem urgent is going to be much more encompassing. Um, and the government's own guidance do recognise this, that if somebody is not really expected to leave the UK any time, then you should be more generous about what counts as urgent um, and assume a minimum of six months, but you can assume longer if that seems reasonable. Um, it should be our decision as clinicians whether treatment is urgent or not. So this is something you might want to advocate for, um, i.e. Um, making sure that you um, really hammer home that this child does need this treatment to prevent deterioration or disability um, and it cannot wait until the parents find the money. Um, but again, um, I just really want to emphasise that that family will still receive a bill later. That might come with consequences such as um, their debt being referred to the Home Office. Um, it doesn't make the care free just because they get it up front. Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through a bit of a quiz um, about who it is, it isn't entitled to um, NHS care. I'm sorry, I realise I've left off the letters. So it's a bit hard for you to reply, but um, if you could just quickly maybe put in the chat, talk through if you're watching with others, who on this list will not be charged for their care, definitely, regardless of their status. Um, immigration wise you don't need to type in the chat why because i think it'll take too long but just um pop in the chat who will get their care for free Great, so we've got some answers coming in. Um, so, um, said A, um, yeah, a few people said A, that 19 year old in A&E with a risk factor, that's right. Um, the, um, they, she will get her treatment for free because um, she's in A&E. Um, someone else has said, so C, four year old at the GP for viral and juice weeds. Yep, they will get their care for free because they're in a GP setting and GP care is free for everybody. Um, yep, yeah, 73 year old receiving TB treatment. Again, um, uh, they will get that for free because um, that is TB treatment. Um, someone has said the severe viral induced wheeze. So that child has been admitted to the ward. So they will be billed for that care, although it's an emergency. So they can be treated before they're billed. The family will be sent a bill retrospectively if um, they don't have um, if they don't have the right immigration status um, and someone else has said the 26 week but unfortunately again that baby that baby's family will be charged for the care on NICU because it's secondary care in an inpatient setting even though it's urgent they'll still get a bill retrospectively and even if that baby is to die um, the family will still be billed for the care in NICU up until the time of their death um, so so yeah, the, the only the only three people who won't be charged are those in A and E, um, in GP, or meeting a specific um, exemption for their type of condition. So um, I'm going to move on a little bit because this is the safeguarding um, chat. Um, I want to talk a little bit about rights to other services. Um, so and I think this is again um, an area of widespread misunderstanding. So um, in this country, your access to um, healthcare has got very separate entitlements to access to other types of public services. Um, so all children have access to school regardless of immigration status. They all have access to statutory child protection. So if you're making a referral for safeguarding concerns, social services um, are able to and have an obligation to pick that up regardless of the child's immigration status. 
And as we've already said, everyone has access to primary care. So that, um, that is sort of universal services that everyone can access. We've already talked about the secondary healthcare restrictions, um, but that is different from other types of public benefits. So um, access um, to most types of benefits and to housing support, and also very topically to free school meals, um, you won't um, be entitled to those things if you if you are undocumented. But in addition, people who have got formal immigration status might have a condition on their visa, which is no recourse to public funds. Um, and if you have that condition on your visa, you're excluded from the vast majority of public services. Um, I think free school meals um, have been added back in during the pandemic, but that's a short term measure for COVID. So um, at the moment, at least. So, so prior to that measure, um, children who have no recourse to public funds on their visa will be allowed to go to school, but they won't get free school meals, however destitute the family is. Um, so basically, the take home messages here are the rules to entitlement to public services are very complex. Um, so if you are unclear, do get specialist support for your patient. There's a lot of um, migrant law centres that can advise, and I'm going to put some links at the end to places you can refer for support. Um, and just to be very clear, because this is a really widespread misunderstanding, including among people like overseas visitors managers, if um, you meet a child who has no recourse to public funds, um, and you might know that because of their social worker tells you, um, or because the family raises it as an issue, that does not necessarily mean that they are also excluded from NHS charging. In fact, they often will be entitled to free NHS care if they have a visa with that title on. So yeah, they're, they're, they're different things. Um, they both cause a lot of issues for the family. Um, and if there's any um, uncertainty and you need to know what they do and don't have access to, um, get specialist support. And you can always refer to social services for safeguarding reason. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the impacts of, um, of NHS charging and the way that I think that interlinks with other safeguarding risks um, for these families. Um, so this is all based on um, some work that a few of us did with the RCPCH. Um, and so this is a survey that went out through the college asking health professionals if they've met um, children, families and pregnant women affected by NHS charging. Um, and I'm going to all of the quotes that are on the next few slides are examples from, um, that, um, from that survey. Um, and I think illustrate a lot of both the impacts of the charging regulations and also the associated child protection issues. So first of all, um, in our server, we found a lot of evidence of people being deterred from accessing healthcare because they were scared of the bills they might receive, um, because they were scared of being referred to immigration services and potentially deportation. And also quite a lot of um, survey respondents talking about the way they felt their patients were being racially profiled. Um, because although um, actually, if you, um, if you're British and live overseas for some time and then return to the UK, um, you will be, you, you strictly speaking, ought to be billed for your NHS care. But I think a lot of people find that if you're white with a British accent um, and you fall into the category, no one will ever ask you. Um, whereas um, a lot of reception staff are kind of, unfortunately, racially profiling people based on accent, based on skin colour, and those are the ones who get challenged and subsequently billed. Um, so, um, yeah, in, a, in our survey, we found lots of reports of that happening, including um, for healthcare professionals who reported having seen children who presented um, in critical or life-threatening conditions because they had delayed attending healthcare for so long. Um, and of course, these children would have had free access to GP care, which might have been able to be preventative, but lots of families don't realise that or face barriers to registering with a GP. 
Um, and yeah, a lot of the cases we had were, were pregnancy cases, and this is a um, an, at the bottom in blue, an example of a pregnant woman who didn't um, engage with antenatal care because of the, the fear of being billed, um, and then had uh, severe complications, um, which of course would have resulted in significantly higher charges, both the costs to the NHS and a significantly higher bill, which she probably wouldn't have been able to pay. Um, and I think it's worth sort of tying this into to safeguarding because, uh, of course, when we when we see children presenting very late to the A&E department or freak, or multiply DNAing from follow up or from clinic appointments, we often start wondering about neglect. Um, but um, here we have often families who really want to be able to access care for their children, but don't realise that they're able to get it um, or are avoiding it for other reasons. Um, and I don't really have um, some definite answers as to how we kind of unpick that because it's not parental neglect in the way that we classically talk about it. But I will come back to some suggestions of what you can do once you've met these children. Um, I just wanted to bring in COVID here because um, uh, Although COVID is exempt from charging officially, um, I think it, it's sort of absolutely exacerbating these difficulties. And there has been one case of an adult um, who died at home of COVID, um, quite a young adult um, who was a key worker, but didn't have um, a formal visa. Um, and he um, had COVID, was too scared to attend care because he was worried about deportation and then died. Um, So um, I was talking about um, delays because of delayed healthcare seeking um, because of families' fear, but we've also seen lots of reports of delayed healthcare where they've come to um, seek healthcare, but their care was then um, refused or delayed by the NHS. Um, so there's two cases here, one in which the child attended for their outpatient appointment was fully entitled to NHS care because they had refugee status, um, but they got turned away at the reception desk. So we might have seen that as a DNA if we were sat in clinic, but actually um, it was an admin issue and it only got picked up um, because the GP um, was quite well, um, uh, well aware of these issues. And then the second case, and, and unfortunately we have quite a few cases like this where there were delays to cancer treatment um, because of um, the hospital wanting the, the money up front. So again, I think we should consider this a safeguarding issue when it affects children because if we, if there was a significant delay to a child's care because a parent was refusing the treatment, we would start considering whether that was neglect, whether we need to override the parents, whether we need to involve social services. And yet we have regulations um, within the NHS that force a trusts to deny children health care. Um, and again, I, th I think we haven't really grappled with this um, properly um, from a safeguarding perspective. Um, there's a lack of clear guidance from the GMC on our obligations in these cases. Um, but again, I'll come back to some things that I think we potentially can do. Um, I'll come back to trafficking a bit, but just to say, I think there's a huge overlap because a lot of um, survivors of trafficking are unrecognised, which means that they don't have a visa because they've been um, smuggled into the country and then they might get picked up when they get billed for healthcare. Um, so we had a few cases in our survey of women who um, had delayed antenatal care or missed it um, because they were scared of charging um, and had this additional risk factor of having been trafficked. And then finally, again, I think this really overlaps with, with other issues of migration, but um, several responses in our survey um, mentioned the wider impacts of the hostile environment. Um, so um, destitution, lack of secure housing, um, lack of sufficient food. Um, and um, as I say, these children do, do have full entitlement to um, support from social services, but um, once they've come to the attention of the state, um, 
there is potentially a risk of deportation. So you can see why families are scared um, of that happening. Um, and this is just a bit of a, um, a horrible slide uh, of lots of many, many other cases that were reported in, in the survey, just to kind of give you a sense of the types of conditions um, that children are charged for um, and, and kind of the extent of the issue. So um, I'm not going to read them all out, but um, surgical conditions, cancer conditions, um, children um, uh, in PICU, and uh, just to highlight the the top um, the top one in pink about child in PICU, where um, the translator used for explaining to the parents about the severity of the child's condition was then also used um, to tell the parents that they um, were billed. And I'm not sure if it's this case or another similar case, but um, what the professional report in the case said was that the parents thought that that meant that if they couldn't pay, they had to immediately remove their child from PICU. And clearly removing a child from PICU is an enormous safeguarding issue, but this is parents who didn't want to, their child to stop having care. They just thought they were being told by the healthcare professionals that they had to leave. So just to summarise our survey findings, um, we found lots of evidence of harm to patients, including direct harm um, as a result of delays and denials to care, um, and sort of that being exacerbated when they have other vulnerabilities. Um, and we also found lots of evidence that um, the regulations as they stand are currently unworkable. The exemptions are very poorly understood by clinicians, by administrators and by patients. Lots of people feel morally challenged by the issue and in a lot of the cases reported the children were fully entitled to NHS care if, they're, um, if, if they'd been worked through properly. And lots of clinicians thinking that, that charging is unfair and not part of our role. Um, so um, I want to talk a bit more now about what we can do um, because I think it's, it's quite reading through the case studies is quite demoralizing um, but there are things that we can do as paediatricians so first of all um, think about exemptions um, so we've got a guideline now on the rcpch website which i'll signpost to at the end um, if you're look, looking to try and remember what the exemptions are um, and i would always recommend that you signpost patients to migration law centres or to third sector organisations because immigration is enormously complex and actually a lot of patients will have full immigration entitlement to NHS care even if the administrators initially think they don't. Um, think about exemptions, think about advocating for your patient um, as to um, their care being urgent because yes they will still be billed and that has consequences but we should at least treat them so they don't get any further health consequences and then continue to advocate um, for um, the bill to either be if they're destitute for the bill to be scrapped or at least for an affordable payment plan if that's really if uh, it's sort of the worst case scenario um, so yeah, we've done that. checking for exemptions, signpost patients um, regarding their rights. So make sure that people know that they are can register with the GP. And if a child's come in and the family aren't registered, um, try and get them registered before they leave hospital if you can, or at least support them to do so, um, because they will all have access to primary care and. Um, and potentially that can avoid further admissions where they might be billed as well if they have good primary care. Um, signpost them to advocacy services, I've talked about that. Advocate for care being urgent or immediately necessary, as we've talked about, and that is meant to be a clinician decision. Um, administrators often tick the boxes themselves and they shouldn't be doing that. So talk to consultants um, to, to get that sign off if necessary. Um, and, and if there's um, kind of confusion or complications, you could involve the local hospital ethics committee as well, um, or potentially safeguarding services locally. 
to think about charging and think about wider access barriers as a factor if children are not complying with treatment, presenting late or DNAing. Um, explore those issues with families um, because I think we too often kind of have a bit of a knee-jerk reaction that, that there's just neglect and um, there are often very modifiable things we can do to support families accessing care in a more timely manner. Um, if harm has occurred to children because of the charging regulations, then they text it. And the reason I say that is because trusts, um, a lot of trusts, um, their hands are tied on these regulations, or at least that's what they will say. Um, NHS trusts are not making money out of these charges because most people being billed um, are destitute. So they very rarely recoup what they make. And um, and we have that data from FOI requests. So it's not really a money-making exercise, and they spend quite a lot on the admin, um, but they're obliged um, by the Department of Health to continue charging. Um, but obviously trusts have lots of other conflicting um, obligations. They have an obligation to be maintaining the healthcare of their patients, and they have obligations about discrimination. So um, if, um, if we don't evidence that harm is occurring to our to hospitals, then they have then they can't um, challenge these regulations and think about balancing their obligations um, in, in a different way. Um, there's also now a reporting tool on the RCPCH website. The RCPCH has a position statement against NHS charging and um, wants evidence uh, around how it's occurring in practice. Um, this is a much, much, much easier form than a day text. So if you really don't want to do the day text, do the RCPCH form, but ideally do both. You can copy and paste. It's a three box form, so it's really straightforward. Um, and I'll try and put the link in the chat at the end. Um, I know most of you listening will be um, PEDS trainees, but um, if you're working with GP trainees, it's worth saying that there's lots of resources for GPs to make sure that people have access to their surgery. Um, it's a Safe Surgeries Toolkit by Doctors of the World and this Migrant.Health website, which also gives us a lot of the physical and mental health issues. Um, I'm aware that I'm running short of time, but I was just going to quickly run through um, a very brief overview of some pointers on trafficking. Um, these slides are taken from Sarah Boutrust, so many thanks for that. Um, it's a whole talk in itself, um, but very quickly, just um, if you're meeting um, families who are charged or where there's been delays in presentation, um, or um, just you're having a gut and saying that something might be up, think about trafficking. So are there physical signs of abuse? Um, uh, are you worried that somebody that the person that the patient has come with um, is overly controlling? Um, there may well be a language barrier. Um, so start to sort of have that at the back of your mind and think about exploring it. Um, make sure that you're using professional interpreters. Obviously, if we're using family interpreters, um, if, if a woman has come to the antenatal clinic, um, with somebody who's overbearing and you're worried might um, there might be a control relationship there, um, using that company as the interpreter is not going to help you unpick the issues. Um, and um, try and get them alone uh, if appropriate. Um, and then keep keep the um, the child and the family involved in what you're thinking and concerned about, particularly um, obviously with um, if it's if it's a mother that you're meeting and you're concerned about her having been trafficked and perhaps a mother with a young baby or a neonate, um, she is an adult, so it is slightly different to what we're used to in child safeguarding scenarios. Make sure she's fully informed in what you're thinking and what you're concerned about. Um, but clearly, if there's a baby involved, this is a safeguarding situation from their perspective as well. Um, make sure that you're staying safe and keeping um, the children um, in, a, in a safe environment. Um, this is a list of potential screening questions that Sarah has suggested um, that might help you kind of dig into um, sort of getting, a, getting an idea that somebody might be a victim of trafficking, of wood and slavery. So um, 
asking about safety is key um, and asking about their setup at home. Um, clearly these questions are ones that you would definitely want to be asking with the person um, alone and with a translator. Um, so if you are concerned um, that a child has been trafficked, um, then obviously that's um, something you're want, going to want to speak to um, safeguarding about immediately. Um, do highlight specifically your concerns about trafficking and modern slavery and on top of your local service, social services referral, um, there are some national referral mechanisms for trafficking, so there's this NSPCC number um, and they will, they will be linked up together um, uh, and, and obviously this is not something you would be doing alone um, as a junior, speak to your designated child protection need um, um, and um, they're probably somebody you're going to be wanting to be keeping in as a place of safety if you're in a, in a secondary care setting. Um, for adults, um, there will be an adult local safeguarding lead. Obviously, we're much less used to talking to them, um, but um, you can talk to them for advice. There is um, a um, healthcare um, a number for healthcare workers through the Salvation Army for help and support, and then a modern slavery reporting helpline, and both numbers are up here. Um, if, there, if there's children involved, you're obviously talking to child safeguarding as well. If it, if it's um so for us there probably will be um but get advice if it's if it's the parent alone who you're worried about because obviously they and um, there are different issues around consent in that situation and um, make sure that the person has some written information on where they can seek help going forward and um, you for um for both children and adults to refer to um the national referral mechanism for victims of trafficking and modern slavery you don't need to be sure that they're trafficked you only have to have a level of concern that they might be and they can still accept the referral um and then um again this is a whole nother talk in itself um but destitution as we've already talked about very much overlaps with a lot of these issues um, and in fact, um, families who gain um, immigration status are often paradoxically become um, more destitute. So if you have an asylum claim being processed, you will get some st statutory support. You're not allowed to work, but you'll be getting some statutory support. Once your immigration status has been formalised, you're then entitled to work and you quite rapidly lose um, your housing and, um, and support financial support benefits. So a lot of people um, really fall through the cracks after they get the right to remain. Um, so that for the children specifically, there is support available via local authorities for, for children and vulnerable adults, even if they are undocumented or even if they have no recourse to public funds conditions. Um, it is limited and not the same support that you can get um, if you um, have full status, um, but there is support available, so you can still refer children to support by social services. There are also lots of um, third sector and charity organisations. Again, some organisations are prevented from helping people um, with no recourse to public funds. It's a huge issue in the domestic violence sector where charities lose funding if they give support to women who have no recourse to public funds. But nevertheless, some services do exist. So try and signpost. Um, and then just, I think basically, um, make sure you're being curious about what barriers might exist for this family. Some people can't even afford the bus fare to and from hospital. They come in by ambulance. Can they actually get home? Um, what is their living situation? A lot of people are in enormously precarious and cramped living situations, which is obviously hugely exacerbated at the moment when they can't really go out. Um, do they have access to, to food, etc.? Um, as I say, this is a, a huge issue in itself and it, and it applies, thinking about destitution and poverty doesn't just apply to children who are migrants, it applies to a huge swathe of the population. 
Um, this is a really great article um, uh, in the Archives of Disease in Childhood, and I'd really recommend you take a look for a bit more depth about um, exploring destitution with your patients and what you can do to support them. Um, and then finally, um, I just wanted to say that um, remember that there's an awful lot of racism and discrimination faced um, by migrant children or by children who are perceived to be migrants. Um, we're talking a lot about very vulnerable children, um, but most children who've migrated are not undocumented, they're not trafficked and they're not destitute. And we do, do need to remember that as well and make sure that we're not getting biased um, in ways that um, discriminate against, against migrant children. Um, we know that racism and discrimination um, independently worsen health outcomes and there's and it's great there's been a lot more talk about that this year. Um, this is again a whole talk in itself. Um, so this is something that um, even the most privileged migrant children might be facing. Um, uh, so bear that in mind but also make sure you challenge your own biases and the biases of other staff on the ward. Um, because most children who we meet who are migrants or children of migrants um, don't have any safeguarding needs and we do sometimes need to remind people of that as well. Um, so um, I just wanted to end um, on what we can do um, as uh, clinicians more widely because I hope that for many of you um, you'd be feeling quite outraged about some of the, the laws that result in these issues for our patients. Please do talk to colleagues about it. There's a huge amount of, of misunderstanding uh, particularly about access to healthcare with NHS charging. Um, there's a lot of work going on through the BMA through Royal Colleges um, so that you can, so most of all colleges have a position statement against charging, so you can get involved with that. And there are some campaign groups working on this issue um, for healthcare professionals to get involved with. So um, MedAct, uh, Dogs Not Cops and um, Migrants Organise, um, and the BMA also has done some work on this issue. Um, so um, do get in touch with, with me if you want to chat more about how you can get involved in wider campaigning. Um, so um, that's the end of my slides. Um, as I say, this, this is, covers a huge amount of topics. If you want to find out more about NHS charging, um, there are there's a as I say a guideline on the RCPCH website, and we've done a, a piece on the FAMED website um, exploring charging issues, um, and particularly um, for people if you're and talking to colleagues who care for adults. Um, there's this Patients Not Passports guideline as well. Um, I'm going to try and quickly post all these links in. Um, as I said, there's lots of resources out there again about trafficking and um, about unaccompanied child asylum seekers and about destitution. Um, so yeah, as Nia is saying in the chat, please, please do post any questions. We've still got a few minutes and I'm happy to stay on. Um, and please do fill up in the feedback form. Um, that's quite strange just talking into my computer. So feedback is really appreciated. Thanks, Bryony. Thanks. I'm going to close my screen now so I can post links in the chat, um, but I'll stick around to see if there's any questions.
Um, so I'm just going to answer out loud. I'm starting to type and realise so I can just talk. Um, so SS uh, has asked a question about have I ever across a situation um, where the patient's family were denied care in error um, and suffer consequences. Um, I think, um, I mean, yes, um, I, I have, a, I've personally come across some borderline cases where you could argue that might have happened, but it's a bit vague. Um, in our survey, absolutely, there were some very clear cases of that happening. And I think that's a huge grey area. I think, um, who is liable? I mean, arguably, I think um, the, the trust who's charged, if they've charged an error and the child's come to harm and there was a delay as a result, I would think that the, the trust is probably liable. Um, I think if they, if they are chargeable and they're denied care, legally according to the regulations and they suffer harm who is liable because that's a government regulation that the trust has been following um and i and i think as i say there's no clear guidance from the gmc or not obligations there or what would happen unfortunately i think a lot of families facing these situations are don't have um very much resources to be challenging things or to be suing the trust so i think probably um uh, there's an awful lot of risk that's got away with here as a result um, but yeah I think it's a huge grey area um, and then Ella has said whose job is it to actually ask and ascertain whether we should charge um, and yeah so I think I don't think we should be asking necessarily um, especially in A&E um, in A&E the care is free so there's no reason to, to, to start to be asking I think I think what I would recommend you ask about is trying to explore delays to care or what pa parents fears are where you might find out that they're worried about charging rather than trying to kind of unpick their eligibility. Um, because if we because I think um, what we shouldn't be doing is basically finding those patients and alerting the hospital to them. That's not our job. They pay people to do that. Um, whether they should be or not is a whole nother debate. Um, so, so it's the overseas visitors manager's job to be identifying people for charging officially. Um, and I think if we're wanting to probe around the issue, then, then thinking about the kind of wider social factors rather than like, I don't think you need to be asking what someone's specific visa is. We don't know enough about that. And I think you get yourself in, in very muddy waters and, and also might potentially make people feel like you're, you might put off patients as a result. So um, if somebody is kind of refusing to come to follow up, refusing care, um, and you realise it's because of charging, you might want to dig a bit deeper and then you can signpost appropriately. But I absolutely think most of the time, um, you just need to get on and treat that child appropriately, but make sure that your social history is thorough and you, you're kind of spending time getting good enough rapport that families can, can raise their concerns with you. Thanks, Nia. Thanks so much. That was great. Um, I think all the comments are great, so hopefully they'll fill in the feedback. <laughs> Thanks. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm, um, I'm a bit better. 